Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, so wonderful to be here in Trento, delighted, so happy to meet all the postdocs, Aurora, Sara, Alejandro, and wonderful to see Paolo and Andrea again, because we were together for a panel at the, um, the ISA in Yokohama a few years ago. That's where the special issue uh, came out of. Um, all right, so I had prepared, I have this PowerPoint it's very dark, and I had written my name in my university there. It doesn't show, but uh, okay, the, the, it's sort of. Maybe you have x-ray vision. Yes. Um, but I'm in the Department of Sociology at the University of Southern California, where I've also worked with um, and been part of a research center called um, the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration. And this, what I'm presenting today, kind of grows out of a larger team project, which I will speak about um, I guess a couple weeks from now at um, the workshop, the homing workshop. So um, it's about men and it's about Latino immigrant men and African American men in inner city neighborhoods of what used to be called South Central has now been rebranded as South LA. So why bother looking at parks and gardens in the first place, right? They're very easily dismissed as sort of like innocent, superficial places. But I think we could make a, a case for what happens in these places is critical to the well-being of particular neighborhoods, places, and communities. And in general, they've been cast as very positive urban assets, right? They're good for physical health and to fight obesity, which you may know is a big problem in the United States and especially in poor inner city neighborhoods. And they're also, you know, celebrated as sites for, you know, leisure, conviviality, and so on. Uh, leisure is expensive, so parks and community gardens are some of the few non-commodified spaces where people can gather, so they have this kind of outsized importance in um, poor and inner city uh, neighborhoods. Los Angeles, you may have heard, is said to be the most park poor big city in the United States. Um, you know, you could think of New York, San Francisco, even Milwaukee, they have the, their big central parks and smaller parks, but the way Los Angeles developed is a little different. We like our, it developed with the little private homes and the little gardens, so private space is very important in LA. And our largest park, hundreds of acres of, of park is beautiful Griffith Park, but it's sort of like in the north part of LA in very affluent neighborhoods. Now, anybody can go there for free, but it's not easily accessible. When it comes to community gardens, uh, the best estimate we have for the numbers of community gardens in LA is 100. This was put together by urban planning students at UCLA. You know, these are ephemeral, they pop up, they get bulldozed, they erode. Um, but just to give you, by comparison, in New York, there's close to a thousand. Detroit, all these big Rust Belt cities where property has been cheap and it's been easy to go in the city and, you know, uh, transform that has, has allowed them to proliferate. So we don't really have that many parks. We don't have that many community gardens. However, the site of what was said to be the very largest community garden ever in the United States, the South Central Farm, was in Los Angeles. Has anybody here heard of South Central Farm? If you have Netflix, you can go on and see this great documentary called The Garden, which is all about the political process that led, you know, of resistance that actually lost, um, um, and this garden was demolished. But up until 2006, it was a 14-acre farm with over 300 mostly Mexican and Central American families cultivating right here in this very industrial part of LA. I'll talk about it again. But this raises the question, as I've already suggested, does everyone have access to green spaces or is green actually white and affluent in Los Angeles? Well, the, question, the answer is yes. Um, all kinds of, uh, many urban planners, geographers, and sociologists from Lucata Sedaris to Jennifer Walsh to David Truel to Byrne and others, Alkin and McEwlin, have done these incredible studies really just showing how little acreage of gr public green spaces there are in poor communities of color in um, Los Angeles. 
Now, South LA, um, as I said, this used to be called South Central. You've heard about Compton. You've heard about it from the rap videos. You've probably heard about the Watts riots and rebellions of 1965. You've heard about the Rodney King's rebellions of 1992. That's the big general site of this study. Um, these were historically black neighborhoods, African-American neighborhoods throughout the 20th century. Um, in 1970, they were 80% 80, 80 of South LA was African-American. And by 2010, um, about two thirds, or 64% of the population was Latino. So there's been this incredible demographic transformation. This is, these are not communities of super diversity a la Vertovec. These are black and Latino communities where it's very, very rare to see somebody who is unambiguously white. Um, most of this happened in the 1980s and the 90s, the high point of Mexican uh, and Central American migration when over 280,000 Latinos came to this area and over 150,000 African American residents left South LA neighborhoods. We could talk about later if you're interested where they went. Mm -hmm. um, but the upshot is Latinos are now the majority in these three study neighborhoods. Latinos are 70% of Watts, 88% in historic Central Avenue, which I would say is the closest neighborhood LA has to something like a Harlem and their historic jazz clubs and churches there that are still you know, venerated and commemorated. And our other study neighborhood is 69, uh, includes 69% Latinos, that's Vermont Square, Slauson. LISLA, you'll hear me refer just very uh, briefly here to LISLA, that stands for the Latinos in South LA study. That's the larger team study that I'll speak about in a couple of weeks. So for this study, uh, we interviewed 100 Latino residents, first and second generation residents, and I included several questions on that interview schedule about you know, how often do you go to parks, what do you grow, blah, blah, blah. And actually, the majority of LISLA interviewees said they did not go to parks or gardens. And in fact, many said that, you know, they were instructed by their parents, second generation, especially uh, young women said they were instructed to stay away. So one of my sites is Martin Luther King Park, larger backstory to that. Um, but perceived as a very dangerous um, park. You can read the quote I have up here um, on um, the slide. It's from a 31-year-old um, a second-generation woman I interviewed who actually grew up in the inner city and went to University of Pennsylvania, graduated from an Ivy League college. So there are these kind of phenomenal um, stories of, of educational mobility and, and, and still in placement. But the major point here is the fear factor of um, public parks mm -hmm. in South LA, and this particular <clears throat> park is, is pretty tough. So um, early on, I decided to focus on men in these green spaces, because as I started going out with my research teams, with students and my postdocs, it became readily apparent that women and girls mostly don't come to the parks alone or with friends. If they're there, it's in a family context. Women are there taking care of their children, bringing them for sports or to the swings and, and so on. So it's an extension, it's you know, a family labor. Um, so an important anchoring for the study for understanding men is that they are imbued with masculine privilege that allows them to go to the streets, public parks, um, but there to have particular wage benefits vis-a-vis -vis women, domestic benefits that may um, allow them to be absent from the kitchen, um, but they're still um, demarcated by social marginality um, and um, you know, along lines of race, class, illegality, and so on. It's always good to bring in a Doreen Massey quote to remind us that um, spaces are, don't have fixed identities, they're fluid, and in fact one of the things I'm trying to figure out is that in, in my book, um, uh, Paradise Transplanted, I studied these other community gardens in a different place of the cities that were really women's spaces, but that's not the case here in Watts in South LA. 
Now, there are few studies that really look at um, men and marginality and their leisure spaces uh, and their leisure in public places. Uh, so, um, I'm a big fan of this recent book by Suzanne Choi and Yinni Ping, which is about men's labor migration in southern China. It's called Masculine Compromise. And um, they note that usually when uh, male migrants are put in focus, not as androcentric migrants, but as, you know, uh, in terms of masculinity in men, the focus is often either on men at work or really men behaving badly drug addiction, gambling, um, violence, um, and, and so on. And similarly, in um, American urban sociology and ethnography, we have a, a seen right, this traditional emphasis on African-American men engaged in crime, drug addiction, gang violence, and public places. Um, uh, Alice Goffman's book, for example, um, uh, Venkatesh has the book that's uh, called Gang Leader for a Day. You can buy it in airport bookstores. Um, Randall Contreras. Uh, my colleague um, at UC Santa Barbara, Victor Rios, who wrote a, a, a fine ethnography called Punished, um, talks about this whole genre of, of ethnography as really being one of where there's sort of jungle tropes where the ethnographer goes into the jungle and lives with the wild animals and comes back to tell the story. Maybe drives the getaway car, too. Um, my study's a little different. I don't make people really not want to read it because there's nothing that exciting or sensational uh, about it. So my basic questions are, what really, what activities draw men to the public parks and community gardens in South LA? Um, how are these sites used to create a sense of place, belonging, civic culture, kind of a homemaking? I'm very much inspired by Paolo uh, Bocagni's work here. And to what extent are Latinos and African Americans collaborating, sharing, and engaging with one another at these sites? And alternatively, um, to what extent do they stay in their own lane, stay to themselves, or is there open hostility? There's been so much in the media about open hostility. That's kind of a, the backdrop to this. So here's how I did the research. In um, fall of 2014, myself and a research assistant named Christy Hernandez, who grew up in Southgate, started visiting these public parks and community gardens. It's a big area, South LA. It's about 50 square miles with um, 890,000 um, inhabitants. Um, so it's a big space. We had to drive it um, and go to lots of parks. And then in spring 2015, we launched the LISLA project. And I also began with a smaller team of students ethnographic observations at several parks and community gardens in South LA. So this included myself and um, African American and Latino graduate students. I had a postdoc um, um, uh, from Mexico City, another postdoc from the Ukraine. So it was almost like a natural experiment going out right in the, our diverse embodiments to the parks. And then also three undergraduate students, Latino undergraduate students at USC who had grown up in South LA um, or Huntington Park helped me. And then I selected these four sites. Starting in the summer 2015 through 2016, um, I gathered audio recorded interviews at two gardens and two parks. The interviews were conducted by myself and three um, graduate students, Antar um, Chichavacunda, Jose Miguel Ruiz, and um, Adrian uh, Trinidad. So the four sites we selected are Stanford Avalon Community Garden, really an outgrowth of that larger one that I had mentioned, South Central Farm, uh, Greater Watts Community Garden. I should mention these are very racially segregated sites. So Stanford Avalon uh, has 209 plots, and everybody except two gardeners that I have seen are Latino. There's two African American men there. Um, Greater Watts Community Garden is smaller, it's about 60 plots. It's all African American. Both of them predominantly male, both predominantly older men. 
like my age or older. Um, and then um, two parks, Martin Luther King Park in the Vermont Square neighborhood and Fred Roberts <coughs> Park in historic Central Avenue. Here's a map, viewers at home can't see this, but all of you in the room can see this. So that line up at the 10, uh, excuse me, up at the top is the 10 freeway. That's how we call things in LA, the 10. And uh, if, uh, so USC, my university, is um, right by that top green box called Exposition Park. Um, and um, the three red boxes are the steady neighborhoods for Lisla. The one to the right is Historic South Central, to the left is Vermont Square, and at that southern corner is Watts. Um, and those are the sites of my study. Again, two gardens in Watts and one park in each of those other uh, neighborhoods. Uh, we conducted 57 interviews. Um, I did four interviews with civic leaders who are somehow involved in administering or advocating for parks and with NGOs. And then there's kind of an uneven number. You can see the numbers up on here. Um, I, you know, I've stopped the interviewing, but maybe we'll go back to Greater Watts Community Garden to, to get a few more. The story's not saturated. It's been hard to get access, is, is the truth. So these are racially segregated green spaces um, with few shared activities or engagement between African Americans and Latinos. In the interviews, in all the interview guides, I did ask at the conclusion, gee, why, you know, I notice it's mostly African American, why aren't more Latinos here? And we got a lot of statements that kind of naturalized racial segregation at the parks and at the gardens, right? You know, oh, you know, Latinos like to play soccer. We don't. Or, you know, we play basketball. Or, and, and sometimes there are, um, you know, the boundaries aren't firm. There's an African American drum circle that's pretty institutionalized at one of the parks and Latinos and others uh, drop by for it. Um, but there were a lot of, you know, these statements that just kind of uh, rationalized or naturalized um, interactions. Uh, the bulk of my talk, I want to focus on these five themes that came up really strongly um, in um, these interviews with uh, African American and Latino immigrant men at these green spaces. Um, the first one, is the parks and the gardens as almost a kind of religious site, uh, a place for uh, reflection, spirituality, sanctuary, and a therapy that's found in close-up engagement with nature, with plant nature. Um, secondly, um, the gardens and the public parks are places where men can enact um, a, a narrative and a performance of being responsible family men, taking their children to the park, growing food for their families, con growing, connecting with ancestral pasts through uh, cultivation. Thirdly, male sovereignty and sociability, right? It's a place to hang out with other men, um, to build social bonds. Fourthly, um, the gardens and parks are places that are conducive to these at feeling at home, to feeling like you belong, uh, with all kinds of activities that are home-like activities, self-care, um, you know, preparing food, um, intoxication, uh, enjoyment, and, and fifthly, there's kind of an emergent civic culture at the community gardens. Um, it's, you know, sort of nascent, but I think, I believe, the community gardens and parks could be sites for the development of, you know, civic uh, engagement. So I'm going to walk through those five th themes right now, and I'm going to begin by talking about this first theme um, of finding um, sanctuary in nature. And um, I have a few photos interspersed here and um, a cluster of them at the end of my talk. But this one uh, that you're looking up at the screen right now is, um, it looks like a man who's praying. In fact, he's weeding his garden. Um, this is uh, one of the plots at Stanford Avalon Garden. You can see 
large. Each plot averages about 1,500 square feet, which I don't know how to translate this um, into, like, what is that, a quarter, of, you know, half a hectare or something. But it's, it's a good size plot. It's bigger than this room. And um, at the gardens, the men spend a lot of time alone. There's sociability, they help one another, but the act of cultivation um, takes a, a lot of alone time. And um, similarly, at the parks, men are together, but they're also alone. Um, and so many of them talked about these sites as being kind of sanctuary spaces for them. Um, now, I told you about the fear factor at the park. So when we asked men about this, um, men kind of brush this off. Um, so I have a quote up here. This man, you know, says, that's a lie, man. We're sitting in the middle of South Central, and this drumming is what you're hearing. This is what they're doing. Ain't no gunshots going off. I feel at home because I see people with a smile, right? Um, and then he re talks about it like church. We all got problems, but on Sunday, we try to leave them in the house. So there's like the built house, which is the source of all these frenetic problems. And then the park is a place um, for letting go. Um, Isaac, um, this, this next quote came from a, a, um, a very, um, deep interview conducted by Antar at a park with a, a man who was going through a crisis. He had just escaped a rival gang attack. He was going to um, go to jail. That He was going to turn himself in and go to jail um, the next day. But he talked very, you know, viscerally about, as the, the quote up here says, I'm not going to read the entirety of it, but he says, so a park to me is like a sanctuary. It's like going to a church. You know what I mean? A piece of sanctuary, quietness, and just watching people be happy. That's what the park means to me. Um, this was a, one of those magnified crisis moments for him. And actually, at the end, Antar prayed with him in, in the park. How old is he? How old is he? He was about 30. 30. Yeah. Um, as the quote continues, he says, I'm trying to pre prepare myself to go to jail for eight, uh, for eight years. Yeah. Um, and is hoping he's not going to be um, deported. Um, so community gardens also serve as these sanctuaries and sites of freedom and reflection. Um, the top interview quote here comes from a man I'm just going to call James. I conducted this interview at the Greater Watts Community Garden, the African American Community Garden, and James was president of one side of the garden. Each garden has its own leaders. Uh, he was this very um, kinetic, hyperkinetic, always in motion um, um, man who talked about the garden as a sanctuary. He says um, that freedom of mind, he compared it to yoga, uh, but with the physicality to it. Um, again, he says it gets me that sanctuary, that freedom of mind and free thought you know, so you aren't obligated to your responsibilities. Uh, an important difference I found between the Latino and the African American gardens that I haven't quite, I haven't written up yet and quite fully thought through yet, is the African American gardens are sites, everybody grows more, first of all, produce than they can consume. Mm -hmm. And at the African American gardens, they're purely gifting it away. Uh, at first, I didn't quite believe this when they told me. I thought, oh no, they're probably selling it. But no, I, you know, when I'd come around and see, I, they're gifting it to neighbors, to people who walk through, needy people through the church. And I think it really taps into a kind of spiritual and community practice among African Americans. Many of the African American gardeners here also are migrants from the south or one generation removed from the south from louisiana south, south texas arkansas right who grew up in conditions of rural poverty where you know gifting right that, that's chari practicing charity right that's like, so basic mm -hmm. in you know all these worldwide religions um so i think that's another spiritual angle here uh, at the Latino at Stanford Avalon Garden, there's some gifting, but there's also um, uh, produce for sale, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a moment. Uh, below, I have a quote from a, a man I'm calling Tomas, who says, 
I think the connection with the sto soil is really important. Uh, nature, trees, plants give us oxygen and allow our minds to think with clarity. So I might be stressed out and about to make decisions, but once you go to the plants, you clear your mind, your thoughts, your feelings. And you know, he went on to speculate that that's why he thinks there's so much violence in the world. People don't have um, a desahogo, a, a, some kind of outlet um, for, for getting rid of the stress. Um, more quotes um, from the garden um, as stress relievers. Um, as uh, one man at MLK Park said, it's like a meditation. Um, so nearly all of them said something like, this is where I relax, aquí me relajo, es una terapia, right? It's this, this um, kind of site of, uh, there's no yoga studios in this neighborhood, but this is the site where people can go and experience that kind of relaxation, a kind of zen-like spirituality. The gardens are also sites, as I suggested, where men can perform fatherhood and being responsible family men. Um, so the, the photo here is obviously a man who's coaching Little League. The public parks have fields. They've been fixed up. There's been a whole movement in Los Angeles. It's been very contentious to get more money to go into public parks. And mostly they seem to be focusing not on plants, but on um, leisure, sports activity, exercise equipment, um, and the like. Um, so why is the family man narrative important here? Well, because it's racially contested and often inaccessible for men on the margins, for men who are poor, working class, illegal, um, and et cetera. Um, so here one man I'm calling um, Terrell says, you know, I feel like, man, you just got to do this for your own race, for your own self. And then he brings up the, the point. The park is free. The time you spend with your kids is precious. Um, Right, and reminds us that the children aren't going to be that. Now, I don't know that Terrell lives with his children. I don't know that he's taking them to the park every day, but he, he was interviewed at the site with the kids talking um, about this importance. Um, as I will remind you later, this, these parks and gardens are not utopian sites. Um, there is violence and inequalities abound at these, at these places. Um, so in one of the interviews at the park, this one conducted by um, uh, Antar at um, MLK Park, um, a father who was sitting in the bleachers watching his children play organized sports um, kind of motioned over to the side. This park is controlled by a gang, by the Crips. There's another site right next to the playground which has pretty open prostitution and drug vending and taking. For a while, there was a homeless encampment. And the father just kind of referred to these are as, right, the unsavories. That was his, you know, moniker, right? So the site was, the park was still a place for family, for being a responsible family man with your kids. Um, but there's a little boundary making. Um, at the community gardens, Children are really not present. People talked about it. Up here on the screen, I have this quote from Don Pablo, who was reminiscing about when he separated from his wife. Um, his children were young, but he would take them in the, uh, to the gardens. But honestly, I rarely, if ever, saw children at the community gardens. Um, um, I think they were, you know, mostly going to be seen as a nuisance, and this was a space for men and, and older men. But part of what's happening at Stanford Avalon Community Garden is a lot of the men are producing, are cultivating produce for sale. Um, they are growing mono crops of um, papalo, this particular culinary herb that's popular in Oaxaca and Puebla, chipilín. Nopales, this kind, you know, cactus, um, romeritos, as well as you know, tomatoes, radishes, Swiss chard, lettuce, um, and I'm sure you've all heard the term food deserts or sometimes food apartheid because these are constructed. 
Um, so these men are, you know, by putting this produce into the market, are putting fresh, green, um, and sort of like, you know, ethnically familiar foods into um, the local market. Um, lunch trucks, marquetas, buy from them. And then families just wander, I'll show you photos afterwards, wander up and down the, the corridors, the main corridor, maybe shouting out, you know, can I buy two dollars worth of um, cilantro, three dollars of um, tomatoes, and so on. So, um, this allows the men at Stanford Avalon to earn a little bit of income. We can think of it as breadwinning for their families. Many of them were quick to tell me, I can't live, it's not enough money to live off. They're just supplementing. There's a lot of cost to cultivating there too. Um, and uh, I should mention that technically this informal income generation is illegal in Los Angeles. There's been a big movement lately to legalize um, street vendors' food and it'll probably get down to legalizing this eventually. So it's, it's um, yeah. Um, uh, one other important thing to talk, say about in terms of family is, um, as you know, um, the quote here from Don Jose says, uh, reminds us, many of the men said, yeah, I learned to cultivate from my parents, from my grandparents. So there's this connection to ancestral pasts. And for Mexicans, a very important symbolic connection to uh, la tierra, to having mm -hmm. land. Um, the gardens are also sites of male sovereignty and sociability. So this is probably um, uh, one of the best photos I have to show you today in terms of just describing what Stanford Avalon Community Garden looks like. It's set below these big power lines in, um, in uh, uh, Watts. It's owned by the Department of Water and Power, long-term lease through an NGO. If you fly into Los Angeles, um, you're likely to be right about where that plane is. The flight path is just beyond there. Um, and this goes, it's nine acres, and it goes through many blocks. And on either side, so this is kind of a public space where this is where people who want to buy produce can walk through. Men gather here. Sometimes there's little benches. And then you can see their gates, which are padlocked when they leave. And at the end of, um, usually at the end of every little parcela, there's a, a little casita, a little house, a little shade structure um, for hanging out. So um, we don't see men gathering in this photo, but there's a lot of informal chatting. Um, sitting together under a little casita like this is a big part of garden life. Um, so as a lot of men said, you know, platicamos así nomás. We're just sitting around, we're talking, we're talking about our own matters, right? So a lot of uh, visiting. Um, the place um, just to spend time. Uh, one man I met who was kicked out of the garden, I think for drinking or, yeah, I think dr drinking excessively, um, still routinely came back to visit. I always see him there and he's there with his friends. He can no longer cultivate there. In fact, he's found just public land right by the freeway that he's cultivating very illegally. <laughs> but um, it's a sight to, to be. At the parks, as I've already mentioned, different uh, group activities bring different groups of men um, together, and these get, you know, sort of racially coded. Um, feeling at home is a big part of life at the garden. So I love this photo of this little casita, um, which you can see is decorated with these um, little symbols of home life, a little rancho, right? There's no real roosters or chickens there, but here are some little decorations that look like roosters um, and chickens. So this is pretty finely built um, casita with a very nice pitch roof. Others, as you'll see, are just tarps, plastic tarps stretched out. Um, this one has real chairs. Some just have, you know, a bucket turned over. But there's all kinds of home-like practices um, that emerge here. Um, one gentleman I met very early on was a 95-year-old Tarascan Indian man from Mexico, 95 years old with this impeccable, exquisite posture, bien derechito. 
and he took the bus every day um, from Montebello, it was about one hour, <laughs> and he would come to the garden and cultivate his plot. He was so generous. I remember he gave bottles of water, or was it soda, to me and my students the first day we visited. Well, he became sick, um, and it became a cause of concern among his friends. So the younger men, the men who were about 60, um, would cook food for him, would look after him, would tend his, his parcel. And so there's self-care and this kind of care for others. Um, as I mentioned, there's sort of just basic food preparation and shared meals that occur at the garden. So like little tiny hibachis, little rudimentary stoves or hot plates. Um, this thing about visiting the casitas and personalizing them with some little, you know, decorations or your own tools. Um, kind of creating this home away from home, a male home, for sure. Uh, <laughs> a home away from home, playing cards, dominoes, um, enjoying a little bit of a happy hour, right, some beers after the work is over. Um, and at the parks, um, there's something um, similar happening. So some of the Latino men um, at the parks will show up after work. There's one of the parks at Fred Roberts. They drive up in their trucks. Um, there's a liquor store, by the way, across the street from every park in South LA. These are seen as nuisances, but they're, if you want to buy a beer, there it is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, there's no beautiful little outdoor cafe like we have in front of the sociology department here. And uh, so it becomes an after work um, uh, bar. The drum circle is a place, right, for playing music, getting high. Um, and all of this has created this deep sense of love and pride in, for these spaces. Um, at the park, excuse me, at the gardens, there's, um, I think, a deeper personal connection, right? These are more private spaces, and men have put a lot of sweat equity into not only cultivating their plants, but getting that space ready for cultivation. So they have a real sense of ownership and belonging. As that quote I have on the screen says, a nosotros nos tocó limpiar. They have all these stories about what a mess these abandoned lots were when they first came here. Um, and so today they feel really happy and really proud of um, what um, they have produced. And so it is that the gardens, the community gardens, become this very enjoyable, kind of routinized um, part of life. Um, I have this quote up here from Don Ricardo, still working at age 75 at um, my university, it turns out, the medical campus as a cafeteria worker, age 75. That's um, his most recent job. He loves it, he said. Um, but he said of the garden, esta es mi vida, this is my life. This is where I'm entertained or distracted. My mind is off things while I take care of a little plant, caress it, take off the little jacket that is bothering it. Right? I mean, he's talking like, you know, the mother of a little baby. Um, I'm tired when I leave work. Here's where I rest, where I relax. Here, I feel as though nothing is missing. I feel good here. I feel better here than at home. These interviews, by the way, with, with the Latino immigrant gardeners were done in Spanish. This is my own English translation. Uh, another man, Don Guillermo, said, you know, me siento muy a gusto aquí. I feel really good here. And he described his daily routine of what he does. He gets up, he dresses, he gets something to eat, and then He's here and he, has, he does whatever he needs uh, to be um, done, over and over. Um, the fifth theme, and the last one I'm going to talk about, is this kind of emerging civic culture um, at the community gardens, palpable at the community gardens, less so at the parks. So that's me standing right there, kind of in the middle of this big circle. This was Valentine's Day of last year. And um, on Sunday morning at Stanford Avalon Community Garden, um, 
once a month they collect the rent. I have not mentioned that it's $20 a month to, for a water and rental fee, not insubstantial, right? And um, so every Sunday morning at here, this place in Watts, over $4,000 in cash is transacted and there's a whole little accounting system and there's these little meetings. It's broken up into different sections. Well, on this particular day, this Valentine's Day, um, this was kind of like almost an uprising. Um, rumors were, uh, word was that the water rates are going up. This year we finally did have rain in California. We appear to be out of the six or seven year long drought, but we have been in the stark drought and it takes a lot of water to grow plants in hot, uh, dry, arid California. So word was that all the water rates were going up. And the young woman standing to the left, I can't, I don't know if you can see her, but with the long dark hair and, and the, the dark hoodie, was a representative of the local, um, well, it's, it's called Los Angeles um, Community Garden Council and then another group called Lot to Spot. And she was here, she was just the messenger for this bad news, but really it was like the whole crowd was, had you know pitchforks and was ready to storm uh, the Bastille or something. <laughs> and um, in fact, so uh, one of the leaders with the straw hat here, uh, Don Pedro, was speaking, another leader was to the right. Um, subsequently this week, they did go down, um, they mobilized themselves and they went to City Hall to uh, explain their case. I couldn't go, I had to teach sociology or something. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, you know, this takes some organization, and that was truly a grassroots effort, and a grassroots effort I want to emphasize against, you know, speaking back to the NGO, right, the nonprofit organization um, that um, is working with the city. But there are a lot of conflicts and diverse views of self-governance at these community gardens. Uh, one man, Juan Pauline Arturo, said, well, you know, es una rompecabezas. It's a puzzle with one person saying one thing and another another. Um, you know, they had just held these new elections. You know, there's a lot of veneer of democracy. I found this at the other community garden I studied. Five minutes? Yeah. Um, at the other community garden that I, I wrote about in Paradise Transplanted, um, and, you know, so there's a lot of distrust of democracy in action and self-governance. Don Ricardo said, parece una escuela de niños. It seems like they're kindergartners running this show here. No faith. Somebody else said, pura política en estos campitos. It's just politics in these plots. So a lot of people are just saying, I just want to grow my vegetables, socialize, and you know, leave me out of this. So what's the upshot? Well, um, as I said, my point of departure is Latino immigrant men, as well as African American men in South LA, are both shaped by masculine privilege and social marginality. It's masculine privilege that allows them access to these spaces, and social marginality that prompts them to seek sanctuary, these narratives and performance of family, man, respectability, male sociability, sovereignty, and home. So they share similar struggles and are fulfilling similar kinds of needs. I never found openly, there, there's violence around these places and especially at the parks, but I never found open black, brown hostility. Um, but I also didn't find African Americans and Latinos engaged in um, shared projects. Uh, as one man said, um, we're stay people are staying in their own lane, right? Get the image of these freeways. Um, I don't know. We'll see what uh, Paulo thinks, but I'm uh, and uh, Andrea. But I, I think you know, partly these are kind of like semi-public, semi-private spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, where these kind of at-home feelings and practices um, are, are making place at the parks and community gardens. And I think it's possible to see immigrant integration as a process of inhabiting places and activities and 
uh, as, as Paolo Bocagni has written, homes, it's possible to see homes as places that are familiar, routine, and um, secure. And I think this is as relevant for African American men in these sites as it is for Latino immigrant men. Um, they say every picture tells a story. So now I'm just going to show you a cluster of photos and maybe you'll see other stories. So I just added these um, this morning. So here's a site from the street. Um, many of the men drive to st from outside of Stanford Avalon Garden. A lot of um, trucks. Many of the African American men um, drive better cars and they don't drive trucks and they park on a kind of a driveway area. But I think it's important to point out there's a porta potty here and there's also one at um, the Greater Watts Community Garden, which was the site of great contention at the, the last community garden I studied. Here's what one plot looks like uh, with a monocrop. Um, you can see nopales growing at, uh, in the back, a little casita, and of course um, are all important palm trees, and this butts up against somebody's house and garage. Um, the plots are not personalized with names, although sometimes people have added little homey touches, but you're a number here. There's 209 plots, it's fairly big. Um, here's a little teddy bear, I don't know, he looks like he's kind of hung in effigy. I don't know what the story is, but here he was. Um, another little uh, casita, one folding chair here. Um, a friend, a research friend, um, who is an important um, leader at the garden. He's Mayan uh, from Guatemala. Um, he calls me all the time. He's still calling me when I'm here in Italy, although I don't have phone service. But um, he is um, the president of one of the sections of this garden and actually has lots of civic experience. He's been on a neighborhood council, um, been in a parent-teacher organization. Um, Happy to talk about him more. And uh, nopales. There's also some ornamental plants growing. These are places for growing food, but there are also some roses, some fruit trees, some flowers. So again, to conclude, um, I, I think I want to emphasize that homemaking and inhabiting these public places um, can be seen as, uh, it takes on political significance, I think. Um, it's about who has the power and the right to home and belonging in the cities, right? To kind of go back to David Harvey or Le Lefebvre. Um, in South LA, it's important to remember that that's always been contested for African American men, for Latinos, for immigrants, for working class, for poor, for the homeless, and, and so on. Um, these are not utopian places. As I mentioned, there's violence. Um, inequalities remain, like, you know, there are few women at the urban community gardens, not many, a few women at the parks, not many, and mostly not there um, alone. I've already suggested some of the conflicts around the governance, self-governance at the community gardens, uh, allegations of possible corruption, um, and, and so on. But they're sites of these kind of utopian aspirations or imaginaries. At um, the research center that I've worked with at USC, the Center for um, the Study of Immigrant Integration, um, we have defined immigrant integration um, with um, three dimensions, uh, economic mobility, civic engagement, and receiving society openness. Um, but I think how immigrants build social life and engage with the materiality of the local environment, with nature and green spaces in the local environment, also is an important vehicle for transforming the city and for creating the sense of rootedness, home, um, and belonging. So thank you for listening. And I'll put us back, that's the conclusion, and I'll just put us back on this pretty picture yeah. here.